everyone, my name is Kelly and today we're going to talk about the complex numbers and Euler's formula. My goals for this video are to discuss the complex numbers by defining them and then proving this definition within the realm of abstract algebra. We are then going to discuss Euler's formula. I'm going to prove it for you and then we're just going to discuss how to use it and its implications. The complex numbers are denoted by a capital bold C and they are in the form of a plus bi where a and b are elements of the real numbers. So some examples are 4 plus pi i and 3 fourths plus 7 i. We define our operations of the complex numbers as addition and multiplication under the complex numbers. So addition is defined as combining like terms from algebra as denoted here, here's our formula and multiplication is defined as multiplication such as foiling or di double distribution however you multiply this out you will if simplified by combining like terms you get this formula here and because we're in an abstract algebra we've been discussing rings fields and groups and I'm going to claim and prove that the complex numbers are a field so as a refresher, a field is a set under two operations. The first operation is an abelian group, so in our case addition. And the second operation, in our case multiplication, has to be an abelian group as well, but without the first operation's identity. In our case, that is 0 plus 0 i, and that is because it causes problems with inverses when proving it's an abelian group. We also have to show the distribution holds and our notation is denoted down here as our field name with our two operations and then our additive identity and our multiplicative identity. So our proof of the complex numbers, we're going to start with our addition of complex numbers, our first operation, and we have to show five things. We have to show that it's closed, associative, there's an identity, every number has an inverse and that it's commutative. So let's start with closed. So if we take two elements of the complex numbers and we add them together we end up with an element in our complex numbers and this is true because when we combine them, combine our terms that are real numbers, we get elements that are still in the real numbers. So our coefficient and our term that's real are still in the real numbers, so we're closed. Associative, since our coefficients are working in the real numbers, that is inherited. Our identity is 0 plus 0 i, and here I show how when we add it either on the left or the right, we still get our original complex number back. Inverses, if we let C1 be our complex number, then when we add our inverse, additive inverse, we should get the additive identity, 0 plus 0 i. And right here, I show that C1 inverse is equal to the opposite of A1 plus the opposite of B1 i. Last thing is commutative, and this is inherited from the real numbers because addition of real numbers is commutative. So next we have to prove that our second operation, multiplication of complex numbers, is also an abelian group. So first we have to show it's closed, which is a very similar reasoning as addition. So if we take two elements of the complex numbers and we multiply them together, our real and coefficient are both still elements of the real numbers, meaning that it is closed. Associativity is inherited from the real numbers, same reason as addition. Our identity is denoted by a 1, and it's equal to 1 plus 0 i. And here I show that if we multiply on the left or the right, we still get our original complex number. Inverses we'll discuss in a minute. That will be on our next slide. And we'll need to show commutativity, which is, once again, inherited from the real numbers. So let's look at our inverses. So do we have inverses under multiplication? So let's look at our example, 3pi plus 2i. 
We know that if we're multiplying by our inverse, it will give us our multiplicative identity, one plus zero i. Because we're multiplying, we know our inverse is our reciprocal, is our reciprocal. So one over three pi plus two i is our inverse. But now we need to show that it is in our complex numbers. So we're gonna multiply by the conjugate here to get it so that we have an i on the top and get rid of our i on the bottom. We simplify it down. Split it up so it looks like a complex number. And these two terms, so our coefficient and our real term without an i, those are both elements of the real numbers. So we in fact have this inverse and we can generalize this to all complex numbers, and so all complex numbers have inverses. Therefore, we've showed that addition and multiplication are both abelian groups of complex numbers. And our last question is, does distribution hold? And yes, this does, because we are in the real numbers, and so it is inherited that our multiplication and addition will in fact hold for distribution. So therefore, the complex numbers are a field, and we can denote it by C, addition, multiplication, our additive identity, and our multiplicative identity. So now let's get into this Euler's formula I mentioned at the beginning. Now I'm going to give you a hint, since you f won't fully understand um, what this formula is for yet until after I present the proof. Um, but it is a way that we can represent complex numbers. So I want you to kind of think that in, in your mind, and as you see, there's an I in here, so that should give you that clue. So Euler's formula is E I to the phi, where phi is an angle and I is our imaginary number, the square root of negative one, is equal to cosine of phi plus I times sine of phi. So we're gonna start with E to the theta, where theta is an angle, this is the Taylor series of e to the theta, which is known, um, so I shouldn't have to prove this to you, but a Taylor series is a representation of a function in a, as an infinite sum of terms. So we're going to start with that, and we're going to plug in our i phi, what we want in our one side of our formula, into our Taylor series. Then I'm going to distribute our exponents to our i and our phi, so we can split them up. So now before we continue on, I want to make sure that we review our powers of i. i is equal to the square root of negative one. i squared is equal to negative one. i cubed is equal to negative i. i to the fourth is equal to one. And i to the fifth gets us back to i. So now, we plug those in to our formula and we get some terms that have i and some terms that don't, some that are positive and some that are negative. So here is our simplified form here. And I am going to group our terms together. I'm gonna to group the ones that have an i together over here and the ones that don't have an i over here. Now I am allowed to do this because e to the phi, the Taylor series, is absolutely converging, which means that no matter how we order our terms, we will always converge to the same value. This is not always true with all series, so you have to check it if you are going to rearrange terms. So now, I grouped, we had our groupings, and I factored out an i from our terms that had i. So now these are two Taylor series that are also known, cosine of phi and sine of phi. And if you look closely, they are the same as what I grouped. This is important because we're gonna plug that in and we're gonna get Euler's formula, which is important. And that is our proof. Now, why do we use Euler's formula? Well, it's a way of representing the complex numbers, and we'll get to the general form of how to represent a complex number. But we're gonna start with some, what's called the complex unit circle. So we're gonna start with the unit circle review. 
So, as you should have should remember from trig, is that any point on the unit circle can be represented using cosine and sine. X is equal to sine of the angle and y is equal x is equal to cosine of the angle and y is equal to the sine of the angle as denoted here. In our complex unit circle, it's going to be the same way except for we're going to have i sine of phi be our y value. So this means that we're going to make our x-axis the real axis. And I plotted two points, negative one and one on there. And we're going to make our y-axis our imaginary axis. And I plotted i and negative i. So now we can draw a circle between those values to form the circle. And that is our complex unit circle. So any number that we can write using Euler's formula, any complex number that we can write using Euler's formula will end up on the circle. This is a subset of the complex numbers since obviously it would make no sense that all our complex numbers fall on the circle. But let's look at how we can write our complex numbers this way. So let's say phi is equal to pi halves. There you go. There's our dot right there. And we can say that point is 0, 1, i. But we can also write this as 0 plus 1, i. So we're changing, taking our complex numbers and changing it into a coordinate system with our real value being our x and our imaginary being our y. And if we plug into Euler's formula, we get the same exact answer. So now let's look at if phi is equal to pi halves plus 2 pi. So that's if we went around the circle one whole time and ended back at our point. So if we ended up back at the same point, we should end up with the same complex number. We should end up with 0 plus 1i. And in fact, we do when we plug in. And so from this we can derive that phi, if it's equal to pi halves plus 2 pi k, where k is any integer, so any multiple, multiple of pi halves, or one circle around our complex unit circle, we're always going to get 0 plus 1i. So now that we have an understanding of our complex unit circle, we're going to discuss how we can write every complex number using Euler's formula. So I'm going to claim, and we're going to show an example, that all complex numbers can be written in the form of some scalar, k, multiple, multiplied by Euler's formula. Or by an element that's on our complex unit circle. So some point on the unit circle, on the complex unit circle, if we multiply it by some k, we'll get every single comp, we'll get a complex number. Therefore, we can write every complex number using this method. So let's take an example. 2 plus 2i. I plotted that on our graph, and I'm going to draw a nice little arrow here because we're talking about scalar multiplication. So that means that the point that we're going to multiply has to be on this line. And there's our point right there. Now, if you draw our triangle, you will find that this is a 45 degree angle. But for now, you can take it on faith, but prove it in your own time that it is, in fact, a 45 degree angle. So now we know that 2 plus 2i is equal to some scalar k times e to the i times pi over 4, our angle of 45 degrees. So now we can plug that into Euler's formula, and we get that k times the square root of 2 over 2 plus the square root of 2 over 2i is equal to 2 plus 2i. Looks like we're getting close, but now we need to find out what k is. This is our value of k. So we are going to draw our triangle and find the value of our hypotenuse or use the distance formula, whatever you prefer, 
and we find that k is equal to 2 square root of 2. This therefore means that if you multiply this out, we will in, fa in fact get 2 plus 2i. Hopefully this example showed that we can write every single complex number as a scalar multiple of some value on our complex unit circle. Now the implications of this lie within the ordering of the complex numbers. Ordering refers to having numbers being greater or less than other numbers. So in the real numbers it is clear that 2 is greater than 0 or 5 is greater than negative 5. But the question is, is there an ordering for the complex numbers? So if we look at our complex numbers, as we defined in the previous slide, we get k e to the i phi is equal to a complex number. I'm going to rewrite this as r e to the i phi, where r is our radius. So it's a little easier to understand if r is our radius and phi is still our angle for some point in, in our real and imaginary axis. It does not have to be on our complex unit circle. So we're going to I'm going to define an ordering to show one possible ordering for the complex numbers. So I'm going to define two complex numbers and we're going to say that if one angle is bigger than the other angle for the other complex number, then C1 is greater than C2. If the two angles are equal, but one of the radii is greater than the other one, then the one with the greatest radii is bigger. Now if our angle and our radii are equal, then we know our complex numbers are equal. And we can define addition, but I'm only going to be working with multiplication. And so if we multiply two complex numbers, we, our coefficients multiply together and using our properties of exponents, they add together. So let us look at an example of this. So let's define two complex numbers. Our first one is 1e e to the i pi halves and the other one is 1e e i to the 3 pi halves. So our first one, c1 is this dot right here and it does fall on the complex unit circle but they don't have to be, we could change the radii. And then our other one falls down here. As you see we've gone 3 pi over 2. And since our angle for C2 is greater, we're going to say that C2 is greater than C1. That's our ordering by definition. So let's multiply these two numbers together to see what happens. Use our multiplication. And if we multiply we get 1 times 1 and then we add our angle and so we get 1 e i to the 2 pi which is this dot right here we go all the way around our circle 2 pi to get c1 times c2. But there's something special that's going on here. So we know that it's equal 1 e i to the 2 pi but this is also equivalent to 1 e i to the zero, right? Because we could have zero degrees and end up at the same point. This is a little fishy. So based on our ordering, if we compare these two together, we get that the one with the two pi, well two pi is greater than zero, so we should have one e i to the two pi is greater than one e i to the zero. But we know they're equal at the same time because we can write the complex numbers using multiple angles because we have the circle that we're traveling around. So this is a contradiction to our ordering that I defined in the video. And actually we can prove um, in a more general case that there is in fact no ordering of the complex numbers and it really falls on using Euler's formula to show um, that we can rewrite these complex numbers and there is no way of ordering them unlike the real numbers which are nice that can fit on a number line. So thank you very much for listening today. My name is Kelly and have a good day.